Okay, well, thank you for doing this, by the way. Uh, like I said, this is a little bit unusual time of day for us. We may not have as many uh, participants as we normally have. We had about 80 this morning, so I'm not sure maybe, maybe they are done for the day. I don't know. Where are you, uh, Derek? Where are you, where are you at, by the way? Um, I live in Crescent City, California, which is on the coast about 20 miles south of the border of Oregon. Oh, okay. So you're in the very northern part. Okay, I'm at the other. I'm on, I'm in Southern California, so the other side. So I'm, I think I've driven at least. Well, I know I've driven up through Northern uh, California several times. You've got an interesting background. I was reading some of the stuff. You know, quite a quite a bit of different uh, perspectives on stuff. So if you don't mind, uh, this and this is going to be made into a podcast, um, so people will be listening to this. But can you give us a fill me in on, on what's your background, where you, what all the kind of stuff you've been involved with over the years? I'm um, sure. Uh... My first degree was in physics, mineral engineering physics from the Colorado School of Mines. And um, I did that because I got a scholarship. And um, if you can do math in high school, then you probably should be an engineer because otherwise you're an idiot. And um, wait, we're getting a note saying wrong Zoom ID on calendar. I don't know what that means. I don't either. I'm not sure. So <laughs> we'll just keep pressing on. Okay. This is, anyway. Uh, anyway, keep going. So, um, but I didn't really enjoy it. Um, and so I knew I wanted to become a writer. And, um, and so I, I became a beekeeper for many years as a way to um, work very hard during part of the year and have part of the year work less hard and be able to spend some time learning how to write. And then, I went back and got an MFA in my late 20s. And um, meanwhile, I'd become a grassroots environmental activist. And um, the writing and the activism have sort of merged. And uh, now I've, I've got 20 some books out, um, uh, mainly about this culture's destruction of the planet and what we can do to stop it. And then also about men's violence against women and what we can do to stop that. So that's the, the very, very quick sketch. Yeah. I mean, so let, let me just, um, so interesting. Cause you, you had, a, you know, you proficient in math and science engineering, Colorado school of mines. And I remember when I lived in uh, Wyoming, I know that was a very popular location for people to go as far as, you know, engineering and stuff like that. So I know it's a, it's quite a, a popular school, at least in that part of the country for, for that sort of thing. And so you said you went into beekeeping and I have very little uh, knowledge of beekeeping. It's only, you know, peripheral at, at best. And you said, it's hard. what is What is a bee, what's a beekeeper's life? I mean, I assume this was a commercial beekeeper. Were you, were you making and selling it for, to people and how did that work? Yeah, I ran about 300 hives, which is the smallest you can run and still be considered a farmer for tax purposes. Um, anyway, uh, it's, um, it's, it's some of the hardest work I've ever done. Um, you know, the, the boxes will weigh 70 to 70 pounds or more when they're fairly full of honey, 100 pounds if they're really full, and you're moving those around all day. And um, um, I love the bees. I, I, I really enjoy doing that. Another way beekeepers make money is through... Uh, migrating, which I did not enjoy at all. And what that means is you move your bees into almonds, or as they say in that region, almonds. And, um, and then they're there for a couple, three weeks because they need them for pollination. And then you move to another crop and get paid, another crop and get paid. And I, I didn't like that because it was really hard on the bees. And also because there's so many pesticides uh, and they'll stop spraying pesticides for that time but then when they get to a certain petal drop, then you have to move the bees out really quickly because they start spraying again. And it's just, it, it a couple of things it did. Is one is, is it let me, uh, let me know just how much pesticides are used uh, or industrially. It's, it's, it's surprising that insects have survived at all given, given how much they're getting hammered. And the other thing is, and I wrote an article about this back in the 90s for the New York Times Magazine about how it's um, having this massive concentration of 
bees in one place and then also uh, having bees get transported everywhere because um, they'll be in you know, Modesto and then after that they're in Fresno and then after that they might move up to Montana or North Dakota for the summer. And meanwhile, other people are moving their bees down to Florida for the winter and then back up to North Dakota for the summer. The point is that by having such a great concentration of bees and then moving them rapidly around the country, you're, it's a surefire recipe for pandemic, which is what's happened with bees. You had various varroa mites, tracheal mites, uh, colony collapse disorder, all sorts of, of diseases have run crazy through this. And of course, this applies to human beings too, with, with having humans packed in great numbers and then also having them ha be extremely mobile. It is just a real recipe for pandemic. And I'm surprised there haven't been more human pandemics than there have been. Um, anyway, so those are, those are some quick, quick lessons from, from beekeeping. Yeah. And, and I, you hear about it from time to time, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of taken a backseat to, to many, many other issues, but, you know, currently obviously a pandemic being the, the one that's most forefront and in the news at this point, but, you know, um, we see that there are some concerns about bees being the bee populations being wiped out. We see the, the annual, you know, importing them in to do the pollination and a lot of them end up dying because it, I, I don't know how long a bee lives. I don't suspect they live that long regardless, but I mean, I think it does decimate a lot of their, a lot of their populations. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. The bees are a really interesting thing too, because the individual bee through the winter, they can live eight or nine months. And in the summer they will wear out their wings in a month. Um, but, but at the same time you have the individual bees, the beehive itself will act as a collective being. And um, so you can think about the whole, the whole beehive or bee colony as, as one being that will, throw off a swarm, that would be how they would reproduce collectively. Um, and beehives, I mean, the, the collective can last for a long, long time. And the reason I got out of beekeeping was, let's see, it was 90, mid nineties, because I don't remember which mite it was, but they were, uh, the mites were hammering the, the bees so hard that it just broke my heart every time I went out to the, to the bee yards. You know, you have to keep them separated. I mean, you can have 10, 15, 20, 40 hives in one place, but if you're going to run 300 hives, you've got to have drops miles away. So they got access to enough food. Anyway, um, it was the, the, the last two years I did it, I would be going out. And if there was a drop that had 30 hives on it, I might go out every week or two to check on them. And there might be another five or six dead. I was losing 80% mortality over the summer. And you should have, you should maybe lose one hive over the, the entire summer, unless, you know, bears knock them over or something. But for the most part, you shouldn't, you shouldn't lose any hives in the summer and very few in the winter, maybe, I don't know, 5%. And I was getting just these tremendous rates of mortality. And I couldn't, I couldn't bear it because financially it was really secondary. What was really primary was I, I really loved the bees and I just couldn't bear to see all these these friends dying. Now you talk about, uh, you know, and I was looking, you've written a number of books and uh, been doing this for a while now and, and you list uh, environmental activism as, as one of the topics you feel strongly about. Did, did, that, did that experience with bees, is that where that started or where did, how did that evolve for you? Honestly, it started um, because I was raised in the country and we had, you know, horses and cows and dogs and cats and everything. And I spent most of my childhood outside and uh, I fell in love with nature very, very quickly. And two things to mention. One of them is that I was raised a fundamentalist Christian, got rid of that when I was in junior high or high school. Anyway, it was Seventh-day Adventist and we, uh, uh, one of the things that, that Adventists do is on Saturday, you can't watch sports, Friday night and Saturday, you can't watch sports, you can't read novels. Uh, you can only do things that are not, um, I don't know, business or work oriented. So my family spent Saturdays either by myself or with other members of the family out in nature. And it was, that was 
of all the things I, I gave up on the, the childhood religion, most of them I don't miss. But that one, I think it's a nice thing to not work or, I mean, of course, again, as a child, I spent almost all day, every day in the summer outside. But in addition, you know, there'd be Saturdays were spent explicitly taking walks in nature. And, and it was, I mean, that's where my love of nature developed. And then when I was in second grade, <clears throat> they built a subdivision next to where I lived. And um, all of these meadows and pastures uh, were converted to suburb. And I remember thinking, even as you know, second grader, so it's at eight years old or something, thinking, you know, they can't keep doing this forever because where are the meadowlarks going to go? And where will the cottonwoods go? And where will the grasshoppers go? And I remember, I didn't have this language, obviously, but I remember thinking, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet when I was seven or eight years old. And so that introduced me to... So, so that's, that's really where the environmentalism started. Um, and then, uh, you know, it just developed as I, as I got older. Yeah, I mean, that's a per, you know, I'm talking about in, infinite resources, and some people will say, you know, and, and you talk about crowding. I mean, we look at, we've got cities particularly, well, it's, it's, it's not isolated there, but like in Asia, you know, we've got, you've got like Tokyo with metropolitan areas, you know, it's area of 35 million, Beijing, 25 million. We, we've got these massive cities that would have encompassed the population of the entire earth, you know, not just, just a few thousand years ago or even less than that. And so we've got this huge concentration of people. And that's one of the things I think is, is certainly a problem. Um, so, we, you know, there are a lot of people that are concerned about the environment, you know, and, and I think, uh, it, you know, it, it, I think that's a, a fair thing. I mean, whether it's pollution, whether it's uh, a belief in climate change or whatever. I mean, there's different, different aspects to environmentalism, I suppose, or, you know, save certain protected species. What do you see as, as, as a major problems and have you thought of ways to address these things or, or is it addressable? There's some people that would say that there's no such thing as climate change, it's all a hoax. Or there's people that will say that, you know, we need to just not have more humans. We just need to, to stop reproducing and stuff like that. So there's got to, you know, like most things or something, and there's, there's a truth maybe in the middle, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that, uh... Part of the problem, I mean, there are so many ways to address it. And one of them is that um, how we perceive the world influences how we behave in the world. And, you know, I mentioned early on that I live in Crescent City, California, and that's on the coast. I'm about three miles from the coast or so. And a few years ago in the paper, there's a lot of crabbing here. And a few years ago in the, in the newspaper, they had an article about why crabbers work so hard during the crabbing season. And at the time, every crab was worth about a buck 50. And they said, just imagine if there were all these envelopes strewn all over the ground and each one had a dollar 50 in it. Well, you would be running around as fast as you can picking up as many of these envelopes. And that's true. And that's a fine metaphor. The problem is that crabs aren't envelopes stuffed with a dollar fifty. They are beings with lives as valuable to them as yours is to you and mine is to me, and they serve ecological roles. I'm not saying we should never eat crabs at all. We'll we'll get that in a second. That it's the same, there's a great line by a Canadian lumberman. When I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you're gonna treat them one way. If when you look at trees, you see trees, you'll treat them another way. And if when I look at this particular tree, I see this particular tree, I'll treat it differently still. So how we perceive the world affects how we behave in it. And so many indigenous people have said to me that the most fundamental difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is even the most open-minded Westerners generally perceive the world as consisting of resources to be exploited. As, to other being, as opposed to other beings to enter into a relationship with. And again, I want to be really clear, just because you perceive this particular salmon as a particular salmon doesn't mean you can't eat it. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll jump into that, that there was 
years ago, I don't know, 15 years ago now or just longer, there was this guy telling me that because I use toilet paper, I'm just as culpable for deforestation as the CEO of Warehouser. And I didn't, I didn't really know how to, I mean, it seemed absurd to me, but I, I didn't know how to respond to it. And then I was walking through a forest and just sort of ruminating on this when, when a tree said to me, you're an animal, you consume things, get over it. And suddenly I understood I'd been asking the wrong question. And the real question is, what is the fundamental predator-prey relationship? And the fundamental predator-prey relationship is if you consume the flesh of another, you now take responsibility for the continuation of the other's community. So if I eat a buffalo, if I kill a buffalo and eat a buffalo steak, I now have to take responsibility for the continuation of the buffalo community. And the reason this is really important is because if I don't, I won't be able to eat buffalo in the future. And it doesn't mean I have to manage them. It just means I have to protect them. And everybody knows this. I mean, the, the, the mergansers know that if they, they eat all the newts in the pond, there won't be any newts for them to eat next year. And so part of it has to do with us perceiving the world is a giant bank account upon which we can draw as opposed to, um, you know, salmon having wonderful lives of their own independent of me. And there's, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not really sorry. I'm jumping around because that's how I write too. But there's a, a line by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, I think it is about, uh, you know, we have the story of, of the Buddha going out into the world and seeing that everybody is, you know, everybody dies and everybody kills and eats each other. And this is really terrible. And she changes the language a little bit. And she says, what if he went into the world and he saw that everybody is feeding each other and then it would be good. And, you know, so it's a recognition that someday I'm going to feed wild nature and Right now it's feeding me and it's all a big cycle. Um, anyway, so part of the problem is a refusal to give back to nature. Um, and part of it is a refusal to acknowledge limits and whether these are limits on population, limits on technology, limits on how much water you take from the Colorado River. Right now, more than 100% of the water in the Colorado River is allocated. Um, it's just a refusal to acknowledge another part of the problem is as david ehrenfeld says the world's not only more complex than we think it's more complex than we're capable of thinking so we think we can uh we can we can manage a forest and take stuff out of the forest but we don't understand all the relationships within it and that doesn't mean we have to understand every single relationship before we take out one tree it just means that we should approach it with humility. And then one more thing, and then I'll, and then I'll shut up, which is that um, people will sometimes say, you know, well, Indians affected the land base too. And that's very true. And a big difference is that if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, you're going to make different land use decisions than if you're not planning on living there. So if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, you're probably not going to build a city of 8 million people. And you're probably not going to dewater a river. You're probably not going to put endocrine disruptors into, you know, bathe the planet in endocrine disruptors if you're planning on staying there. And so if we plan on, if you're planning on you and your ancestors, you know, it's, it's like an Indian friend of mine said, Okanagan Indian, she's a writer and activist, Jeanette Armstrong, said to me one time, you know, we have as many problems in our community as everybody else does. We get mad at each other. We can't stand each other. All these things. The big difference is, that I know that my great grandchildren might marry your great grandchildren. So we have to find ways to get along. And that's really just saying the same thing, except extending it to the natural world. How would you live if, if you were planning on people you love or planning on being there in 150 years? And so that, that's sort of a, a quick trip. And I'll, I, sorry, I was, I'll say one more thing now, which is if I had to summarize all of my work into one sentence, it would be this way of living is inherently unsustainable and won't last. And when it's over, I would prefer that there's more of the natural world left rather than less. That's the whole point.
Yeah, I think I think most of us, at least in in theory, would like to see that see that happen and, and occur. And I think you know we live in a country where we talk about utilizing resources. I mean, we run up a debt, which you know we just we just it's like money just comes out of the sky. The Fed prints right. more money, so we have this unlimited, supposedly unlimited amount of resources. But when you really look at it, we really don't. And I think that's uh, that's very, uh, I mean, very relevant to to just the the kind of attitude we have that we've got this unending supply of resources, you know, and, and some maybe in more than others. I mean, there's plenty of dirt. I mean, or maybe not. I mean, we're running well, out of soil carbon, right? I mean, but there's there's some things, there's a lot of rocks on the earth. You know, there's a lot of ocean water or something like that. That'd be well, hard to win out of. But uh, So a you know, couple of things. Yeah. One of them is that um, I'm really glad you brought that up because in many ways, um, my environmentalism comes from a sort of personal conservatism that just like when I have a certain income, I try not to live beyond it. I don't, I don't particularly, I'm very uncomfortable doing deficit spending. And, um, and likewise, on the larger scale, um, I just think it's really stupid to wipe out a run of salmon that you might want to eat tomorrow. And so I'm very, just fundamentally conservative that way. And so far as soil, yeah, we are actually running out of soil. There's, you know, the, the Great Plains, I'm sorry, Iowa was like 16 feet of soil or something. And now it's measured in inch, inches. And that's, um, that's a huge, hugely important thing too, that, I mean, so far as farming, so far as raising, you know, food systems, all that, I think that the most important thing when you're building, when you're, when you're creating food is, did my food create soil? And that's a, I don't know. I think that's a really important thing. Um, anyway, yes, I, I think that, that we uh, should not, that's where a lot of this comes from is just, I think it's remarkably stupid to uh, destroy a land base's capacity to support you when you may need it to support you tomorrow. Yeah, I think, you know, Obviously, all of us as human beings have to eat. If we're going to continue as a species, we need to figure out how to feed ourselves, no matter how many of us are ultimately on the planet. Some people would, would extend that argument to energy consumption. I mean, we, we need energy to warm our homes. And, you know, could we, can we find a way to do that that is, that is better? And there's arguments pro and con about wind and solar and so on and forth. You, I'm sure you've seen the arguments on either side. Um, you know, obviously in this community, we're all a bunch of dedicated meat eaters. I don't think any of us are out here with the intent of destroying the, the environment or doing harm to animals or anyway. We're doing it for our own health reasons. And I think, you know, there's no, it's not mutually exclusive to care about the environment and also consume food that makes you healthy. And, and that in, in this case, it happens to be meat. Um, you know, I, one of the things is, you know, I often sort of get pitted against these sort of environmental activists, but typically vegan ones that think that the greatest thing we can do in the world is just everybody go vegan, um, you know, get the animals off the planet. You know, I've seen data that shows that, you know, at least with regard to greenhouse gases in the United States, it's about 4% of our output. Uh, you know, we would, we would create nutritional problems for people. Uh, we might be able to generate more calories, but we would end up with nutrient def deficits. Uh, it wouldn't make much of an impact anyway we're with, with regard to greenhouse gases. And that's not the only issue. I mean, there's certainly, as you mentioned, pesticides and herbicides and, uh, you know, uh, 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 antibiotic resistant microorganisms on and on and on. So there's no, there's not like it's a one-sided issue, but what are your thoughts when it comes to, um, is there, is there sort of a monoethic, ethic, monoistic, look at, at the way you can be an environmentalist. Can you only be environment environmentalist and care about the environment if you don't eat animals or you don't, or you, you have solar on your house, or you drive an electric car. What, what are the, what are the thoughts on that? Well, a couple things. One of them is that there are no personal solutions to social problems. So I think what one eats individually is, uh, is, is a personal decision, but it's not, it's, it's not particularly a social decision. I mean, I, except when I'm away from home, I don't eat factory farm meat. I, I, what I do for, well, and I'll back up, you know, we haven't explicitly talked about this, but um, I have Crohn's disease and sometimes uh, vegans will 
try to insist that I need to eat a vegan diet and a vegan diet would kill me. It's, and it would be a very painful death because um, I can't, I have to be doing really, really well to handle any fiber at all. And, um, and I've just discovered over the decades of living with Crohn's disease that a really heavy meat diet works great for me. And so far as beef, um, I buy a half a cow at a time or a cow at a time from a local grass fed rancher, which is why, you know, I'm pleased that my, uh, you know, the food that I eat helped make soil. And um, so, so, but, but the fact that I eat, I buy a cow at a time from a local rancher does not, uh, that doesn't really make a big political difference. It doesn't, I mean, that by itself is not going to stop factory farming. It's also not going to stop row crop agriculture. So having said that, um, I think in addition that the most destructive activity humans have ever done is row crop agriculture. I think that causes far more problems than, and I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about your community to know if I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, if we, if you've already, you know, sort of hammered the notion of how destructive row crop agriculture is. And if you have, I won't, I won't bother to go there. If you haven't, I will. Uh, we, we frequently talk about and had a lot of people that work in the space of regenerative agriculture, you know, particularly animal agriculture, but I, but I mean, certainly it never hurts to, I mean, I, I get questions asked to me that I've been talking about for five years. I mean, it's like the same basic stuff. So it never hurts to sort of reemphasize stuff because I don't know who's going to hear this, who hasn't heard it before. So if you've got something that, that, that I think is compelling, please share it. Absolutely. Well, I'm not sure it's more compelling than what your other guests have said about it. But, but yeah, row crop agriculture really is, as Lear Keith says, biotic cleansing down to the level of bacteria. I mean, that's what you do is you clear land of every living being you, I mean, you even destroy the soil by, by using plows and that's uh, both destructive and also short-sighted. I mean, it can last for a while, but it's, it's, I love that old cliche about, you know, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And it's the same. If the soil isn't happy, then ain't nobody going to be happy in the entire natural community. And so uh, I think, you know, turning over the soil is probably the single worst idea that humans have ever had. It's a really good idea for building up a population, for uh, making it so you can have a population large enough to have a standing army so you can invade somebody else, which is great because you have to invade somebody else because you've destroyed your own land's capacity to support itself, to support you. Um, anyway, so back to your, your original question was, um, how do we, uh, well, why don't you ask your original question again? So I make sure I got it right. Well, I just wanted to, you know, there's, there's some people out there with the belief that you cannot care about the environment unless you subscribe to X, Y, and Z. You know, it's, it's, you know, I have to put solar panels on my roof. I have to drive a electric car. I have to eat a diet, you know, perhaps a vegan diet. If you don't do that, then you're, you're clearly, you don't have any, you, you don't have any concern about the environment around you. Well, yeah. And again, personal choices don't make social choices. And, you know, when I was, when I first started as an environmental activist, um, it was pretty funny because we would be one of the main things we did was file timber sale appeals. And what that is is when the, the forest service fed, a federal bureaucracy would uh, put out a timber sale. A lot of times they were illegal in that they would violate the endangered species act, or they would violate the clean water act or clean air act or NEPA or NFMA or some, some law. And, and they're also greatly subsidized. You know, the, 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 the timber companies would be buying big old trees for the price of a cheeseburger. You know, it's, they're paying way under the value of the trees. Anyway, so we would be filing timber sale appeals, which is pointing out how they'd violated the law and trying to stop the timber sale to make them at least put out a, a legal timber sale. And so often when we're doing this, we're just eating, you know, we're ordering out and getting a pizza or fried chicken or something. And, you know, it, it there were some people who were vegans there, but they weren't, it's like, it doesn't matter because what we're trying to do is trying to protect 
you know, 20,000 acres at a time. And it's absurd to say that somebody who's trying to protect 20,000 acres doesn't care about the world because they ate a hamburger while they were protecting 20,000 acres. I mean, that's just crazy. Um, and, and why pick on hamburgers when we could pick on French fries, you know, it's, it's, and, and there's the larger question of, I, I really object to the whole, uh, that, that sort of gatekeeping that if you don't, you know, if you, if you eat meat, then you can't be an environmentalist. If you do this, you can't be an environmentalist. If you do this, then you can't be such and such. And these litmus tests are, I think one of the problems, one of the things, frankly, that's destroying the left is, I mean, I don't care what somebody else's politics are on other issues if they want to protect this specific piece of ground, I'll work with them on protecting this specific piece of ground. Oh, I got to tell you, this. this is so funny. 15 years ago or 16 years ago, I was set to do a radio interview that was set up by my, pub, by my publisher at the time. And they just had contacted somebody and I had no idea what the interview was about. I just know I was supposed to call some number at two o'clock or something. And I call, it ends up, that they booked me for the Pittsburgh Pirates post game show. And I hadn't even watched the game. I like baseball, but it's like, I don't know. And, but so we got 15 minutes to kill me and some guy in Pittsburgh and I hadn't watched the game and I know baseball enough to talk a little bit, but the point is we got 15 minutes to fill and we're both professionals. So we want to try to find something we can talk about. And what we came to really quickly, I know that a lot of people in Western Pennsylvania hunt. So I just went off on this idea. I don't understand why animal rights activists and hunters don't work together to protect habitat. And then once they protected the habitat, the animal rights people can attempt to sabotage the hunts, but you work together to make the habitat. So I'm a big believer in forming temporary alliances to get something done. Oh, a great example of this is right now in Thacker pass in Northern Nevada, there are environmentalists with Deep Green Resistance, an organization that I helped found, are trying to stop a big lithium mine from going in. And uh, they're working with, among others, the local ranchers. And probably we would disagree with some of the ranchers on some issues having to do with, say, pronghorn antelope or sage grouse. But it doesn't matter because if the mine goes in, the sage grouse and pronghorn antelope are gone anyway. So let's work together with the ranchers on this issue and be real clear about, you know, we might disagree on a different issue, but we'll work together on this. And then when this issue is done, then we can go back to being at each other's throats. And I think that that's, so I don't really like those. And besides which my politics don't fall into any sort of neat little boxes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an extreme environmentalist and at the same time, and I don't want to get in a big fight about this, but it's like, in some cases, I support the death penalty. So a bunch of lefties just hate me because it's like, how can you be a lefty when, well, Ted Bundy, there's my answer. It's like, you know, so, so I've had the same thing. I've worked with some people who are, oh, one of my best friends is a tea party guy, you know, and we disagree on about, I don't know, 50% of our politics and 50% we completely agree on. Or another great example is my sister. She's really right wing. And uh, she and I were arguing one day and we got sick of arguing and we tried to find places we have in common. One of the things we have in common, even though we come at it from radically different directions, she was on a city council uh, somewhere in the East Coast in Virginia. And we agreed that if a developer from Washington, D.C., this was actually happening in the town where she lived, a developer from Washington, D.C. wanted to come in and build some mega mall in her town, and she opposed it. I would have opposed it because I'm opposed to mega malls. She opposed it because she's very much in favor of local control. And she thinks it's terrible 
that a developer from 100 miles away wanted to build it. If a local developer would have wanted to build it, she would have been in favor of it. So we can make these political alliances. It's like, sure, I'll work with a vegan and great. We can work to protect some land. And then when you want for a lettuce farm to go in, I'm going to fight you on it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I see that, you know, like one of the things that I see is, you know, I totally agree with you on the fact that this, this sort of row cropped, you know, agriculture has been clearly destructive in, in many ways. And, you know, there's not to demonize, you know, we, we, we certainly are like excited about ranching and regenerative ranching and holistic grazing and those things, but there's ways to grow crops that are more holistic where they don't have to no till agriculture and other things, no pesticides. There's ways to do that. And we have a, uh, you know, some people that are, you know, vegan animal rights activists that just want to get rid of completely all animals that are being used for food, which I think that is a, that is a tough hill to climb. I mean, you're going to really battle to convince every human being on the planet uh, to, to, to give up eating what we've been eating for 3 million years. But I think there's a way, there's a way to form alliances to where you could say, well, you don't like this particular practice. You know, some people call it factory farming. There's different, you know, there's different variations. It's not all they're not all the same. There's differences between them, but you could certainly put some of that energy and say, instead of opposing this, why don't you support this? Uh, you know, because that's, sometimes that's, but you know, it's kind of an athma to say, Hey, as a vegan, you should support regenerative animal agriculture because you're killing less animals. You're protecting the environment. You're, you're protecting the soil. Many of the things you're in, you're in favor of, but just because of that one sort of thing, you're going to be against this. And I think there's so many, there's so much energy, you know, with activism, you know, I'm, I'm 54, I'm an old guy. Uh, I don't know how, how old you are, but I mean, there's a lot of that comes from, you know, 15 years old on, you know, 15 to 25, it seems to be like the prime activist energy, you know, because I guess we've got more, more, uh, more time, more <laughs> leisure time, I suppose. And some other people that might be stuck with families and jobs, but, you know, trying to reach those guys and say, Hey, why don't you look at it from a different angle? Uh, and, and see where there's alliances. So I, I definitely agree with 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 uh, with some of that stuff. What uh, has your has, have you? I mean, doing this, I guess you've done this for a while. Have you seen any ways that are successful in, in mobilizing people that are more successful than others? Is it just outrage? And you know, it's today the outrage changes every three minutes. So I mean, it's like people are pissed off about this on Tuesday, and by Thursday they're mad at something else, and they've forgotten whatever happened on Tuesday. Yeah. Um... I'm going to approach this through the back door. So when you said Southern California, where are you in Southern California? So I'm in, I'm in Orange County in a place called Laguna Hills right now. So, so it's, uh, you know, kind of a suburb type place, basically. Okay. Um, I was asking, because when you said Southern California, I was one of San Diego. So 10 years ago, I had to get a surgery at Scripps Green Clinic down in La Jolla or yeah, I think wherever so, La Jolla, it is down yeah. there. Yeah. And... Um, and the thing that blew me away about that hospital was how nice everybody was. Like, I remember scooting along in a wheelchair and a janitor is just, he makes a point of giving me a big smile and saying, how are you doing? And I didn't have a bad experience with anybody down there. And later I was talking to, I, I went to, I was invited to the board meeting of Patagonia uh, which is a big company. And uh, it was wonderful. Um, the people at Patagonia really are dedicated to saving nature. It's, it's not greenwashing stuff. It's, it's great. Wonderful. Anyway, so I'm chatting with them and, and they're all very nice too. And I asked them, so how do you make it so, I, I, I told them the story about Scripps Green Clinic and compared it to some other hospitals. And they said, I said, how do you make this happen as a, as an institution? How do you have a a personality. And they said, everything isn't who we hire. That if somebody's a jerk, we just don't hire them. And so we try to hire, it's very important to us to hire friendly people. And how does this apply to what we're talking about? Well, I've seen so many environmentalist organizations and so many activist organizations of different sorts get destroyed because a narcissist or sociopath takes over the group or people start coming in picking fights and a great example a great story about this is i wrote a couple books with this guy george draffin and one time he said to me 
that he helped bring Earth First to, to Washington State back in the early 80s. And at that point, he helped bring them in because they were a bunch of people who were angry at what was going on in the forests. And by the late 80s, he quit Earth First because it had transformed from being a bunch of people who were angry about what was going on in the forests to a bunch of people who were angry and had found an outlet for their anger. And there's a big difference between being angry at a thing or an injustice or a whatever it is you're angry at and being an angry person who happens to have, be able to point your anger in maybe a good direction. And so any advice, the thing I would have found that really works for organizations, at least as it, it, it's, we're trying to do it in, in our organization is to vet people really carefully so that the people that you get are angry at injustices, but not angry people who happen to have found an outlet. Um, and then the other thing is to just be really diligent about um, about about when you when you do encounter when people do come into the group who so years ago i used to teach i used to i used to teach at a prison at a supermax prison teach creative writing and i became friends with one of my students and he was a self-declared sociopath but he was pretty cool to chat with in the circumstance of you know class and everything and because he was in prison, I wanted to like make his life a little bit better. So I started introducing him to a bunch of my friends through pen pals. And, and the interesting thing is that really quickly, everybody who was communicating with him started fighting with each other. And my point is, and we've all experienced this in our lives sometime, how one person like that can affect all these other relationships around them. And I mean, I, I don't, so, so, so one of the things to, to, to make a short answer to your question at long last, um, I would say one of the things that's really crucial to maintaining an organization is making sure that the people are not, uh, that the individuals involved want to work on the issues as opposed to um, manifesting their own primary neuroses. Yeah, I, I like that. I, you know, don't hire angry people, hire people that are concerned about an issue and can direct their energy that way rather than, than just, they have this sort of need to contain their, their, yeah, their personal neuroses, whatever that might be. I heard you mention Crohn's disease. I'll just, just as an aside, I'll mention that we have, uh, quite a few people with with uh, inflammatory bowel disease that, that are in this community that are seeing sig significant success with animal based diets with with regard to to you know you know basically getting them off meds and stuff like that. So that's just something interesting. I don't know if you've uh, been tempted to look into that, but that's something we see quite a bit here with this kind of crazy uh, meat based diet that you know you've got these people here. I I, I know you mentioned, and I I, I don't want to mischaracterize you, but did, you said something about something about women or female rights or act or feminism or something. I can't remember. I thought you mentioned that. Is that, was that, did I mishear that? Or what was the thought on that? Cause we have, it's just, it's just me and you. And I think it's mostly females left at this point in the chat. There might be one other male in there. What, did you say something about that? I wanted to, I couldn't remember. I said one of the things that I work on is men's violence against women. Okay. Obviously no one, no one, no one supports. I don't think anyone supports that. And I think everybody would certainly be, uh, uh, you know, in favor of, of minimizing, reducing it, and hopefully it, it never happens. But how does that, how did that, how did you get involved in that? I mean, that's, that's, I mean, was there, was there a particular instance that, that sort of motivated you to uh, look into that issue? Well, my father was extremely violent. Um, he broke my sister's arm. Uh, my brother has epilepsy from blows to the head. I uh, he raped my mother, my sister, me. And uh, so I have done, I mean, it's so, and we can talk about that if you want, but the, but the, the thing that, that I found really as an adult that I've really sort of focused on with it is how R.D. Lang, the psychiatrist, had 
he, he described what he called the three rules of a dysfunctional family, which are rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence rules A, A1, or A2. So what this meant within our, my family structure is we could talk about anything we wanted except for the violence we had to pretend wasn't happening. And on the larger scale, the same thing is true, that we can talk forever. And don't get me wrong, I like sports. We can talk forever about, you know, March Madness or, I mean, go Gonzaga, by the way. Anyway, we can talk about whatever we want for all these issues except we can't talk about 200 species went extinct today. We can talk about, you know, Wall Street endlessly, but we can't talk about the fact that the Colorado River, the Rio Grande River, the 25% of the rivers in the world no longer reach the ocean. So I'm really interested in, in how we, or, or you mentioned earlier that, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea you have to be vegan to be an environmentalist. So you have to own a, electric vehicle or you have to own a solar panel. Well, I have a book that's just out last week called Bright Green Lies. It's about how solar panels and um, windmills and all that are really not good for the planet at all. And they also won't even work to power an industrial economy. So the point though, is that, and one of the things I think is so fascinating is how did environmentalism get captured such that at one point it was about protecting wild places and wild beings. I mean, you know, there's the whole save a whale or, you know, bunny huggers or tree huggers or whatever you want to call them. And that's been transformed over the last 30 years into buying electric cars, solar photovoltaics. And I'm not, I'm not attacking you for this. I'm saying this is a really common impression. How did that happen? That's an extraordinary transformation and, and, and a false trans. I mean, it's, it's a transformation to something that's false. Um, and then I want to switch back to something you said a minute ago. I'm just curious as to, to how mine compares to, to everybody else's diet here, that when you say primarily meat-based diet, I eat probably 80% of my calories are from meat. Um, when you say primarily meat-based diet, are you saying like 80%? Are you saying 50%? Are you saying 100%? What's, what's the sort of standard there? So many people in here are 100%. You know, and people particularly that are dealing with autoimmune diseases, they tend to find the best success with 100%. It's an elimination, basically. And they do that for three months, six months, a year, something like that. And then some people will gradually add a few things back in there. But I, I would say the majority of the people probably that, that participate in this regularly probably maintain somewhere between 90, 95% with, you know, a certain percentage remaining hundred percent. That's, uh, you know, my diet personally, you know, I'm, I'm in my background, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, uh, athlete, you know, all that stuff, but I've been, I'd say 99% meat based over the last four and a half years. And the, the exceptions to that have been uh, some dairy, some eggs. Uh, occasionally I'll have a piece of birthday cake on one of my children's birthday, but with rare exception, it's pretty much, a lot of meat, you know, a lot of red meat, which is, you know, it's kind of interesting, but I mean, we, we see people with literally Crohn's disease every single day resolve that. I mean, it's, it's pretty shocking. And, you know, I've got gastroenterologists that are now prescribing it to their patients based on the collective experience of this community. So I think that's been something that's been really eye opening to me. You know, I wanted to, uh, you know, cause I, and, and certainly when I asked you about uh, uh, violence to women from men, I, I mean, I certainly see the, 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 what, what would have driven you there based on that, what you told me. But I mean, recently, I guess in London, I mean, I'm sure you, you saw this, there was a, there was a female that was, it was allegedly, well, not allegedly, she was killed. I think a, a police officer has been charged with that. They had a, uh, you know, candlelight vigil. And then there was more sort of going like, and there were people actually proposing that they should do a curfew on men after 6 PM. And I just, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on that sort of thought. Is that, is that, does that sound a little bit odd to you or is it something you would be in favor of against? Well, I don't think that a curfew on my father to keep him home after 6 p.m. would have helped. I think that, uh, um, you know, most of the violence to women, most of, when, when someone is killed, the first person the cops always look at is somebody they know. You know, most, most murder is actually the, the, the crime that has one of the highest closure rates, highest successful closure rates of any crime. Because, you know, my house got burgled a bunch of times many years ago. And um, 
you know, any, it could be anybody, you know, it's just it, in this case, we ended up catching them, but it was, uh, you know, random kids who'd been walking through the forest and found my home one time and seemed like an easy mark. So they hit it again, but it was random kids, random teens. And that's not how it is for most murders. Most murders is, you know, brother, uncle, neighbor, whatever. And um, so, no, I don't, I don't think that a curfew, it, that, I mean, it, it's, it's not realistic also that, uh, I can't see, I mean, it's very interesting. You know, one of the reasons that prohibition took place in the United States, it wasn't just a bunch of sour pussed old women who wanted to make sure that nobody else could ever have fun. A lot of it was prompted by rates of, of domestic violence with drunk husbands. And the, uh, so there's a rationale for it. It's just, I mean, that, that particular approach did not particularly work. Um, and I think that a curfew would be, oh, as long as you're, did you say orthopedist or orthopedic surgeon? Uh, technically, it's the same thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, as a surgeon, this would be like using a sledgehammer when you should use a scalpel, you know? I, I suppose a sledgehammer would be useful for some surgical procedure, but I don't know what. Well, we use some big mallets, but I've never, I've never had to use a sledgehammer, but I've used them as many as five pound mallets to knock things out. So, uh, yeah, no, I get your, I, I certainly get the point. I, and, I, and I kind of agree with, is there anything like, you know, we see a lot of stuff going on in, in the world of uh, environmental activism in the name of climate change, a lot of proposals, you know, we've got a Green New Deal that some people oppose. Are there any things in there that you think that, you know, maybe we should just sort of say, wait a minute, we're not, we're not going in the right direction. I personally, you know, as, as someone who enjoys and, and quite honestly depends on meat for my health, I'm very concerned about uh, calls to perhaps tax, tax meat, to restrict meat, to limit access to meat. I mean, I, you know, if, if, if there's a way to make it available in the, in the degree that I would need it and, 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 and also improve the environment. I'm certainly for that, but the absolute prohibition of this stuff, uh, are there, are, and, and you know, you see this stuff, we're going to increase solar, we're going to increase wind power. And you just talked about how that may not be a, a viable solution. In fact, we may be shooting ourselves in the foot by that. What other environmental issues or solutions you see out there that are perhaps short-sighted? Well, most of them. Um, because they don't actually help the real world. And also, just as, a, as an example of, of how, um, okay, when they talk about solar, wind, all that, that's for electricity only. And electricity is only about 20% of the total energy use. So they're talking about stuff that's, that's actually a pretty small percentage. And an example of why they will never work for across the board is look around right now and ask yourself how many trucks were each thing that you can see on and trucks are powered by diesel which has an energy density of about 46 megajoules per kilogram doesn't matter what a megajoule is just the important thing is the number lead acid batteries are 0.1 joule per kilogram and lithium batteries are like one joule per kilogram it's 146 of what diesel fuel is. And so the point is that you can have a semi tractor, a diesel semi with uh, a range of 600 miles on a tank of diesel and a 55,000 or 60,000 pound payload. And to have that same range of 600 miles, it would have to have a 55,000 pound battery, which only leaves a 5,000 pound payload. There's no point. So it won't work. So, if you want to have stuff driven by trucks, then you're still going to have to have diesel. Plus you have to have diesel for the mines, for the solar. I mean, all this stuff is just um, not helpful to the planet at all. And so most of the solutions I see are basically just uh, excuses to hand money to 
to their favorite sectors of the, of the capitalist economy. So what I would do if I were in charge is I would, and we all recognize that free market capitalism only exists for small companies, that all the big companies are basically running on subsidies. And what I would do is I would subsidize behavior that I like. So I would subsidize any form of agriculture, which is going to be a lot of this regenerative agriculture. But if, if you can make a, if you can make a vegetable farm do this, then that's fine. Any form of agriculture that improves the soil, because that's also going to sequester carbon. So I would be shoveling money hand over fist to various regenerative agriculture schemes. Um, that's something that does work. I think most of the other stuff, frankly, is not particularly helpful. Um, in fact, it's, it's destructive. Um, yeah, so the main thing I would do for global warming is uh, attempt to transform the agricultural system in a direction I think that you would probably, that the people here would probably like, frankly. Um, more grass-fed beef, more wild salmon, uh, um, more, and this would help, you know, family farmers as well. It's, you know, I've been working on the, since the nineties with uh, sort of organic farmer movements. And even in the nineties, they were saying that, you know, small chicken ranchers or chicken farmers were being driven out of business and turned into serfs for Tyson, basically. Um, and that was making, this was making not only them unhappy, it was also making the chickens unhappy because they used to be, you know, farm pasture raised chickens and now it's stuck in a little building or stuck in a little cage. And I don't think this helps, I don't think it helps the meat. I don't think it helps the chicken. I don't think it helps the humans involved. I don't think it helps anybody except, except makes money. Yeah, I mean, the industrialization of food, I mean, you know, the people will, that, that benefit from it will say, well, well, look, we can feed more people and we can do it more efficiently. We can bring the price of food down. But, you know, again, what is the cost to human health? What is the cost to society? What is the cost to the environment? Uh, you know, we don't see the, we don't put that in the calculation. You know, interesting. I was just, I was talking the other day with a, with a rancher up in, uh, you know, up in rural Wyoming, a place called Tackle 10 Sleep, Wyoming. And Wyoming passed this fruit, Food Freedom Act, which allowed better access, direct to consumer access from the rancher, which I'm fully supportive. And I think we need to, we need to continue to push on that. But that, that, uh, that bill, it was passed through the Wyoming, uh, you know, House of Representatives and made it into law went under the radar of the national governing bodies. And apparently the national governing bodies or whoever's overlooking all this was very upset by that because it kind of went against the beef industry standard, which is basically run by Tyson Cargill, JBS and, and uh, National Beef, which has now been bought by Marfrig. But they basically, the guy that got that bill passed apparently was run out of office, uh, basically by sp outspent by his component, his opponents in the next election and funded by the beef industry to get him out because he went, went, went counter this stuff. So it is definitely, even within the beef industry, there's, 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 there's this, this desire to, you know, profit, 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 profit. And I think that's, I, 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 that does shouldn't surprise people. It doesn't surprise me having been around for a while. So, I mean, now, when you say uh, this may be the best solution, do you see, I mean, are you hopeful that we can get that off? I mean, what has to happen? Are you seeing anyone that's, is there any hope that you see with this new political administration or anything in the future that's, that's making you think this is a realistic uh, uh, thing that could happen? Well, I, I don't have a lot of faith in the, the new administration for any number of reasons. Um, and I think that one of the things that needs to happen for uh, one of the things I would like to see happen would be I would like to see environmentalism return to its roots of caring about wild beings and wild places as opposed to pushing wind and solar and I would like to see it return to, uh, I would like to see it care more about soil and I would like to see, see, 
it's, it's really difficult because there are some animal rights activists who do some really good environmental work. There are some. And there are also places where it's just a disaster. And I'm thinking about a friend of mine who teaches at a university in, in New York State. Uh, and that, new, that, that university has a legacy forest. It was left to them by somebody or another. And in recent years, that forest is really falling apart because there are too many deer in it because they've killed all the predators. And whenever the university tries to hire some hunters to come in and kill some of the deer, um, animal rights activists shut it down. And this is a discussion that could be had, but the point is, as the, these, these hunts are getting getting shut down, the, the forest itself, and this, this friend of mine is, he loves amphibians and, and ground dwelling birds. And they're both getting hammered because the deer are eating all the brush. And we, I would love to see the environmental movement get back to having a holistic approach of you know, nature loves a community and to look at the entire community as opposed to getting upset that some deer are going to die. And I really wish that the environmental movement would, would just go back to Aldo Leopold's notion of a thing is good when it tends to pre preserve the, what, integrity, stability maybe, um, and beauty of a natural community. I, I, I really wish it would return to that. And I don't see, short answer your question. No, I don't have a lot of hope in the short term. It's like, it's like this one person says, things are gonna get worse before they get worse. <laughs> well, that, that, that puts us, that, that, that certainly gives me a lot of hope. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, you know, I, when you talk about the, the stuff, I know, and maybe this was overplayed, but there was a, there was a, a short video talking about the reintroduction of wolves in a Yellowstone park, you know, a few years back, you've probably seen that film. And they talked about when the predators were reintroduced, it actually changed the entire ecosystem to where the rivers changed course because beavers started building dams and, you know, all that stuff. And so you have these, you know, again, these unintended consequences of people thinking they're doing the right thing by getting rid of these evil wolves, perhaps. I don't know why they went away, but perhaps that was the case. But uh, have you seen more examples of such of that? Or do you, do you think that was just overblown? Or is, that, is there something real behind that? No, it's that's absolutely, if anything, it's understated. It's, it's miraculous what can happen when, uh, when a a biome, a natural community gets its full complement of creatures back. Um, it is, and I don't words, use the word miraculous lightly. The same thing can happen. You mentioned beavers. The same thing can happen when beavers come in. They create habitat for a whole host of, of other species. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that, that is the good news. And I'm going to have to go in a couple minutes, but that's the, the, the good news here is that we don't actually have to do that much. We just have to stop destroying everything. And if you, you know, one of Lear Keith's best lines is life wants to live and it does want to live. And if you just, so I have a, I have a friend who's a fisheries biologist and we're sitting by the ocean one day chatting. And he mentioned to me that, that sharks the skin of sharks is the perfect roughness to minimize the drag as they swim. And I know that this guy attends church every, every weekend. So I asked him, do you believe in, you know, some sort of God who was creating some sort of intelligent design here? And his answer just, I loved his answer, which was there is great intelligence in time. And what that means to me is that, you know, the elk and the beaver and the trout and the, and the willows, they all evolve together and they know how to live together in a long-term community. And if we just let them do it, they will. 
<clears throat> you know, a great example of this is there are more than 450 dead zones in the ocean. One of them has recovered and it's in the Black Sea and it was the biggest and worst dead zone in the world. And the reason it recovered is because the Soviet Union collapsed and with the collapse of the Soviet Union it was no longer economically feasible to uh, do monocrop farming in the region. And when they, when the agricultural runoff in the early 90s stopped because it was no longer economically feasible, within 15 years, the fish had come back so much that they could have a commercial fishery again. And that's the, where the good news is, is if we just stop destroying it, just allow the beavers to come back, allow the carpenter bees to come back, allow the, the salmon to come back, um, they'll do it. And see, this is one of the things that kills me too, is the population of Del Norte County where I live is, I don't know, 30,000 or something. And the population prior to conquest was about 15,000. It was actually a really high population here because there were so many salmon. And, you know, I just read an essay not very long ago about, I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically about how we misunderstand Los Angeles completely because it wasn't a desert. It was actually a paradise as well with, I don't know if you, if you know this, but I just, I love this, that, that uh, the, the, the grizzly bears who lived in the LA region were as big as the Kodiak bears up in Alaska. They were some of the biggest bears in the country because the weather is so perfect. They never had to go to sleep. And there were so many almonds. I'm sorry, not almonds. What am I saying? There were so many, uh, oh, acorns, acorns, and uh, so much other food. They just became these immense bears. And, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things we can do is reintroduce wolves and allow wolves to come back, allow mountain lions to come back, and they'll, they'll lead the way. Yeah, I, yeah, I went out there as a, just, you know, obviously most of Southern California is desert, you know, except you can get right up against the ocean. But I've got a friend who runs a regenerative ranch just about 10 miles from my house. And he literally, his ranch is basically fireproof. You know, we've got all these fires raging through, you know, various parts of California that now and every year, it seems like. And when you properly manage the land, it, 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 it sucks enough moisture in there. In fact, it's interesting. I, and something I learned, which you may or may not know, but just by changing the way you, uh, you graze animals, you can actually change the local climate and you can increase rainfall just because of there's more local water, you know, sequestered in the soil and that, that puts out rain cycle, something I didn't know. I know in the, in the Chihuahuan desert in Mexico, there's a guy who's got, I don't know how many acres, thousands of acres where he's basically turned it from desert into grassland, which is, which is amazing. And so, yeah, I've heard that California used to be lush tropical, not tropical, but very lush and, and very, you know, very sustainable, which, which it isn't anymore. And so that's, uh, I mean, it's hopeful that we can get it back if we, if we do the right things. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to mention one more thing about, about that too, which is uh, the early European explorers would, who talked to Indians would, some of the Indians would have this notion that prairie dogs brought the rain. And a lot of the, the settlers said, oh, that's just silly. But it ends up that prairie dogs do something similar to the, the, the cattle in this case. They, the, or the, that, man, that specific management that the prairie dogs will uh, help increase the water in the local water table, which then brings the rain. It's, 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 um, yeah, so, so bring back the prairie dogs too. Well, Derek, I, 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 I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much. This has been very, very interesting. Um, can you let people know where to go if they're interested in uh, perhaps, uh, uh, finding out more about more of your writings, get some of your books. Uh, do you, I don't know if you have a, of an online presence, but if you could, if you do, could you share that? Yeah, it's DerekJensen.org, D-E-R-R-I-C-K-J-E-N-S-E-N.org. And um, I got a boatload of essays I've written over the, over the decades and um, also descriptions of my various books. Okay, Derek, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. You know, like I said, anything we can do for you, let us know. Like I said, if, if you're interested in looking further into Crohn's, let us know. We can certainly guide you in that, in that direction, but uh, thank you.
You guys have well, a great Thank you day. so much. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. And like I said, my, my diet's already about 80, 90%, 80, probably 80% meat. Okay. Well, that's good. That's, that's, that's good, good nutrition. I'm not going to argue with that, but uh, anyway, you guys take care and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.